Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So, everybody, it is a delight to welcome a friend who's known me pretty much my whole life, uh, maybe even before I was born, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and that's Dr. Marilyn uh, Simons, uh, who is now currently, I think she's unemployed. I mean, you were the <laughs> president of the Simons Foundation uh, and we're speaking in December, right after you received the highest honor awarded to uh, to human beings by the uh, French government called the Légion the honor. Now, Marilyn, I got a C minus in high school French like 30 years ago. So please don't hold me to account. I know you've been practicing, but first of all, how are you doing today, uh, Marilyn? And congratulations. Um, I'm doing great today. It's great to see you and be here with you, Brian. And um, one comment, I was never officially employed by the Simons Foundation as a donor. That would kind of make me have a conflict of interest, but I was, did have the title of president, but never received a salary. Right. And now I'm in the same position for our private foundation. Hmm. So and in the same employed, not employed role. <laughs> um, and when I think about you, the first thing that comes to mind is curiosity. When I think about all the different things you're so interested in, I'll relate a very quick story. When we were in Chile in 2019 to do the groundbreaking for the Simons Observatory, uh, you, uh, after we were up at 17,200 feet, you scampered up there almost from sea level by yourself, like a, like a <laughs> lovely mountain goat. Uh, when you got there, uh, you did the groundbreaking better than the strapping young men we were with. Um, and then we came down, we did some late night observations of the heavens using optical telescopes. And it was really delightful for me to get to show you, you know, everything that's been my childhood passion. And I thought I could impress upon you, you know, how much I know about astronomy since you knew me as a kid. And there you are looking at Jupiter and telling me all the names of the moons and all the names of the, uh, of the different objects we were seeing. And I was like, I, I can't even, I can't even like one up her in this. She has to beat me in crossword puzzles. And, and it was, it was frustrating, but I, I do want to commend you on this, this radical curiosity that you have. And I want to start maybe with your beginning um, uh, after we get into what the Legion de Honor means. Let's talk about that. It was last given, it has been given to people like Alexander Fleming and Jane Goodall, who's a hero of mine. Uh, what is the Legion de Honor and uh, what does it mean to you when you uh, won it? Well, the Légion d'Honneur actually was an award that was started by Napoleon mm. to recognize people for their service to France. So it's a really high honor, and there are different levels of being um, in recognized. Mm -hmm. And I found out that I was immediately promoted to level two. So I'm an officer in the Légion d'Honneur. Wow. And, um, well, a funny story about how I first learned about this. Jim and I had a friend, and he was always making up stories and pulling our leg. And he came to our house for dinner, and over cocktails, I told him, that I thought that the dry cleaning company must have left a staple on his lapel. Hmm. And he said to me, he explained to me that that was not a staple. It was an award from France, and he was recognized by the, as a member of the Legion of Honor. But of course, I thought he was totally pulling my leg. <laughs> Um, but it turns out it was true. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's when I first learned about it. And, um, you know, you might wonder why, what was my service to France? Mm -hmm. And aside from being a Francophile, like so many of us around the world, um, it has been for the work of the Simons Foundation and our support of basic science research and mathematics. And many of whom 
our, many of our grantees are French citizens, and even many of our researchers at the Flatiron Institute come from France. They have a remarkable culture and emphasis on research and science and math. So naturally, when you want to find the very best people in fields, many of them are in France. Yes. Right. Yes, very much uh, a, a quite an inspiring country for many reasons, and and not the least of which is their dedication to you know pure science, which is what I think about, not necessarily applied and looking for things. Although some things come from some technological benefits, do come from pure research, from fundamental research. But as you got the uh, word of this notification. Did you feel any kind of pressure? You know, I only know about losing things like losing the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> did you feel when you saw the list of people, including Jane Goodall and Alexander Fleming and um, Emmanuel Charpentier, would, were you intimidated at all? Was it, was it sort of nerve wracking or were, were, did you take it with your uh, ordinary, well-known sense of <laughs> Marilyn Simon's aplomb? One can help but figure um, assess if you really are deserving. Mm. But um, when I spoke to the people at the Institut des Autitudes Scientifiques, which we call IHES, mm -hmm. um, one thing that was explained to me is, you know, there are not a lot of women in philanthropy making big gifts, and most especially, supporting basic science and mathematics. So they definitely wanted to recognize my role and support of basic science and math. And by the way, Brian, one thing that I learned going into the award ceremony, uh, talking about French culture, in Paris, there are over 80 streets that are named after mathematicians. Mm. I mean, we just don't have anything like that in our no. culture. No. So I think we could all learn from and try to emulate their respect for the work being done there. Yeah. And even in, um, even in other countries, much smaller countries, take New Zealand, uh, the New Zealand, I think it's the five pound, five dollar note or ten dollar note has Ernest Rutherford, uh, who did most of his discoveries on the nucleus while he was in the UK. But he is on their, you know, one of their most uh, used uh, currency uh, bills. And I think it's uh, it's quite striking that how prominent other nations make their scientists and 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 so forth. I actually had the honor of presenting an award to Michio Kaku. Um, at the uh, at the French embassy in in Washington D.C. last month in November, uh, for the Arthur C. Clarke Foundation, I'm affiliated with them, and in the French embassy, I was just blown away. On they had a whole an enormous hall dedicated to Marie Curie, and and her amazing discoveries in radium and and transformative ideas about science. And it seems to me they were really kind of ahead of the time, both in their science and their promotion of science, but also in women in science. And I think that's a topic that, that is near and dear to your heart, um, is not only supporting women in science, which you do exceptionally well, but being a role model. And I want to go back to your uh, upbringing and to your career as an economist and obtaining your PhD. Uh, first of all, do you consider economics a science? Is it a science? They, they call it economic sciences and the Nobel Prize for, for uh, this field. But do you consider it a type of science or is it more like uh, psychology in a sense? Well, it is human related. So it's a what's called a social science. Mm -hmm. It's harder to do experiments the way, you know, when we think of science, we think of empirical observation and rational deduction of to get a better understanding of the world around us. And I would say that economics is striving to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. No, there, but um, it, it's clearly there is a difference. It doesn't have that we know 
fundamental laws that will govern outcome, although problem, you know, there are some, there's fundamentally supply and demand and, um, but it's a work in progress. Yes, indeed. So talk about your, I don't think I've ever heard you talk about your thesis work. Um, when you were a graduate oh. student at Stony Brook, um, what was your title of your thesis and what drew you to economics in the first place? First of all, in the 1970s, it wasn't so common for women <laughs> to be in that field. It was a very much male dominated field. In fact, I think it's the least um, gender balanced of all the Nobel Prize. I think only one woman has won the Nobel Prize in economics. I may be mistaken. Um, of course, it's the newest of all those Nobel Prizes. But at any rate, what impelled you to take on this field um, uh, of interest? Uh, and, and how does it relate to your you know, early childhood kind of upbringing and exposure from a middle-class family in Long Island? How, how did you go pivot from, from that upbringing to something so erudite and, and uh, enticing, but not normally the choice of a woman in those times, as I understand it. So a couple of things. First, growing up, I grew up in the Cold War and I was always hearing about communism. I remember playing with all the other kids on my block. And one day we we're all playing in Howie Tarplin's um, rock pile smashing rocks and a flame a plane flew overhead oh howie jackson it was a plane flew overhead and somebody looked up and said i hope that's not a russian plane and that's when i learned about the russians and the cold war from the other kids so communism always fascinated me and also you know, you said I grew up middle class. I grew up middle, middle class. And everybody in my family was a bricklayer. My father was a brick subcontractor. And I knew times were good, times were bad. And I remember one day my dad came home from work and he went right to sleep. And I asked my mom, what was the matter with my dad? And she said, oh, he's depressed, business is bad. So I think, you know, just my childhood experiences made me want to understand this part of the world around me, the political threat of communism, and the real threat to our family when times were bad. Mm. And, um, you know, I also went to Catholic girls' school, and I think also the ideals that I learned in Catholicism, I think also made some ideas in socialism very appealing mm. to take care of everyone and think more about equity. Mm -hmm. So, And my mom I, mentioned that you, you wanted to be a Sarina at one point, is that <laughs> Well, that would fit in with the Russians. Very, my, well, anyway, yeah. I did have a love of Russian culture, too. I was mm -hmm. curious. And my own background and my father's side of the family is Polish. Mm. So, um, but they spoke Russian because it was controlled by Russia. So anyway, when I went off to college, I started studying. First, I took a course in Marxist economics, and then I took a course in microeconomics. Mm. But as to the male-female ratio, mm -hmm. that, to me, I was used to being with all girls. So now when I was with all boys, that was great. I didn't know what boys were like. I'd been in Catholic girls' school since I was eight years old to 18. Wow. I'd only had nuns as teachers. So it was pretty interesting to me to have boys in my class and have male teachers. Mm. And I remember at one point looking around the class thinking that I wasn't like anybody else in the class, but then having this other thought that popped into my head, I guess we all love thinking about economics. Hmm. 
So that was the end of my worrying about being different. Mm. And um, it was fun to me. So life was averaging out. And I was, I really liked microeconomics. I always liked math when I went to school. My school didn't teach a lot of science. It had the basics for Mm -hmm. New York State and the basics for math. But after I finished trigonometry in high school, there was no more math. And so actually in my senior year, I took a correspondence course with the University of Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to go to study hall and do my problem sets. And they get sent off to Nebraska to be graded. And um, that was a funny experience. But I'm just sharing that, that yeah. I, I liked math as a kid. Mm-hmm. And um, I really liked microeconomics. It was more mathematical. So um, when I did my dissertation, I really loved auction theory. Mm -hmm. And I did my work on optimal bidding strategies. Mm -hmm. So optimal bidding strategies in multi-object auctions, like the treasury bill auctions, Mm -hmm. I looked at what was the revenue to the seller, in this case, the treasury, under different game formulations of the rules. And my husband, Jim, Mm -hmm. taught me the calculus of variations Mm -hmm. so that I could derive these optimal bidding strategies. But, um, you know, I I really haven't continued with that research. I always say that I went from being a theoretical microeconomist to being a very applied running our foundation. Right. Yeah. It's, it is, you know, a full-time job for, for many people uh, and and just doing it as you did for so long, um, you know, required these tools, I'm sure, uh, and, and and actual application, not, as you say, not just theoretically. Um, And when you think about the kind of structure, the relationship between pure math and connection to a social organization like the foundation. I'm curious, um, in terms of leadership, you might have some ideas grounded in theory, uh, but you know, they, as they say, you know, communism works in theory, but not in practice or so. How do you convey that you know, to an organization that you're the leader of? How do you convey that you know, there is a better way or perhaps there's a different approach um, you know, when everybody's kind of doing everything for the first time? I mean. That was the first time the foundation ever existed and then you were leading it in this capacity. How do you convince people, you know, when, when you're starting from scratch, it's, it's so hard um, to begin something anew. How do you convince them to listen to you, to take what you're saying, you know, with the, the proper amount of attention that it deserves? That's a good question. And I'm sure something that you think about with your own work at the Simons Observatory. Mm-hmm. Um, I think having a really strong team around me so that it isn't just what do I say, but also having incredible visionaries and and leaders who are working together with me. It's never just one person who makes a difference. It's a team that makes a critical mass and you know, getting input from people who are terrific thinkers themselves, you can come up with a plan. And when I talk about our foundation, I always say that we evolved. You know, it grew just as you've experienced with your own observatory, right? Your project Mm -hmm. grew and you have to grow and adapt and go to the next level. And um, we were always looking to get to that next level. But I just think it's the critical mass of people that you have around you Mm -hmm. that builds confidence and you just work so well together. Yeah. And sometimes I feel like, 
you know, with, with folks that are so brilliant in one field, like I work with the most brilliant astrophysicists, scientists, computer scientists, uh, et cetera, et cetera, engineers. Um, and yet we don't spend that much time thinking about management and organization and principles of, of a culture of success, um, because it's, it's actually perceived that that's hard. In other words, if I ask a brilliant National Academy, you know, member of our team, you know, why doesn't, you know, he or she, you know, like, do they, do they pay any attention to best practices and management leadership? Say, oh, that's really hard. I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Because quantum electrodynamics is so easy. You know, everybody comes out of the womb and they know, no, no I had to work on that. And <laughs> I guess one of the challenges I'm curious of your approach on it, how do you convince somebody who is extremely well-developed in one side of the brain? I always forget which side of the brain controls the quantitative side. And I'm sure that makes me the other side of the brain, but, um, but how do you convince them to take that side serious? In other words, the interpersonal skills, the persuasion, there's an awful lot of salesmanship, even in science to get your papers accepted and, and do sorts of various things and, and to champion your brand. How do you cultivate that in an organization? When again, it's ab initio, it's new no one's ever done what you did before. How do you convince someone who's brilliant quantitative um, that the soft skills are also equally important, if not more important? You know, that's why you have to have a team approach. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I worked really closely with my husband, Jim, and Jim is very focused on getting the job done and being goal directed. And um, but we also had people on the team who really focused on communication. And, you know, I think we built it in. And when somebody just say that you have a diversity of needs and voices and messages that you need to deliver, we got everyone to at least accept that there was such a thing as best practices mm -hmm. and that we were, we, that's the direction we were headed. And Brian, I got to hear somebody outstanding that you've added to your project. I think his name is Gary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, it seems to me that you have a team member that you added who's a real voice for culture and communication and strategic building of your project. And, you know, people will listen when the message is delivered clearly. Mm -hmm. So, Yeah. And I think, you know, that comes down to kind of um, conveying a sense of authority in a good sense, like you're an authority on something, not like you're going to do what I tell you to do. And I always wonder, well, how do you know somebody's an authority? Like, how do you know someone's an expert? You should look, um, according to Ray Dalio, who's, you know, I know is friendly with Jim. Um, you know, he says, well, an expert is someone who's done a thing three times successfully. You know, it could be a telescope. It could be a co starting a company or managing a fund or uh, laboratories, et cetera. They've done it, you know, three different levels. And I kind of see that in our educational system. First, you get your graduate school, you know, degree, then you get your, you work as a postdoctoral scholar or fellow, and then you're a young assistant lab leader. And then, then you kind of establish this pedigree of leadership. But, you know, I always think there's got to be a better way, you know, how, how do we, you know, the, how do we inculcate the values and the culture to know, you know, I need a team. And a lot of us are type A, we want to do it all ourselves, and we want to, um, and to resist that urge. And it's, it's really refreshing to see that you've had these three different careers, and, and you're probably gonna have more careers. <laughs> um, and, and I wonder, I know it's an unfair question, but I have to ask it, like, do you have a favorite, you know, my, I always ask my mom, you know, as you know, my mom, and I'll say, you know, who's your favorite kid? Come on. It's me, right? <laughs> That's like asking me, you know, which hand is bet my favorite, my left or my right? And I say, mom, you are left-handed, you know, it's. <laughs> um, so do you have like of the different careers, you know, from economics to philanthropy to, you know, board of directors, Cold Spring Heart, all the things that you've done. Um, is there one in particular that, that really just, you don't need any additional inspiration. It always excites you. Or are they truly like my mom's claim? I don't believe her, but uh, that they're all like your fingers or your, or your hands. <laughs> yeah, they're equally important to you. 
You know, I think that I've grown and been able to do different things at different points in my life. And so I feel now that I'm at a place where I get to integrate a lot of the knowledge that I I learned previously. So I don't think I could answer that question, but for a different reason, mm. because I couldn't have started out doing what I'm doing now. Um, I love like seeing the whole picture. I'll give you an example. Um, I, my niece likes acting and she would talk about like liking to be an actress. And I would say, well, what about being the person who pulls it all together? Mm. Like seeing every role that's going part of it, you know, the screenwriting, the acting, the selling and, you know, getting the support for the film. And, you know, I like those kind of questions. I found it interesting as I got older to be able to see a bigger picture and mm. and look at the way all the parts are interacting. I'm sure you that's your experience at the Simons Observatory too. Yeah. Yeah. And learning right? from the best in the world, the best engineers. And I, I think it's 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 helped me that I am curious, I think like you, and and that I love learning even about learning and I love learning even about management. You know, so I um, I want to use this as an opportunity to pivot to a different direction. So every day I read uh, a couple of books. I actually read a portion from the Bible. I know that surprises many of my scientist colleagues, uh, the weekly Torah portion. I read that. Uh, but I also read ancient, you know, Christian philosophy, you know, Stoicism. And I read something about business because, you know, a book by, like I said, Ray Dalio or Gordon Moore or, uh, or rather uh, Andy Grove books like that really inspired because it's a completely different wiring of the brain and a different way to think about being effective as an executive of, uh, of this project in my laboratory. I want to ask you, Marilyn, do you have a routine besides, you know, crossword puzzles, you know, and uh, we'll get to that later, but uh, besides doing the, the daily mini crossword puzzle, which I think I might've turned you on to, um, oh, by the way, are you doing wordscapes yet? Have you taken my latest advice? I have not, but I've gotten really good at spelling bee. Yes. Oh, spelling bee is great. I was um, a queen bee twice this week. So. <laughs> wow. You can add that to your CV because I know you'll be, uh, you're on the job market. You're looking hard for employment <laughs> gainfully. Uh, tell me, do you have uh, uh, daily routines, rituals, habits? Do you think those are important or weekly ones? And obviously family is, is first to you, uh, but do you have like a daily routine? Uh, you know, I, I know you exercise a lot. What is your day? Like, what does your day look like? I know you're wearing an aura ring like I am. So you must be kind yes. of tracking things, right? Um, yes. but tell me, do you, um, I, I was joking to somebody, Marilyn, I said, I got the aura ring and they're like, oh yeah, I just got the new one, the gold one. I said, oh yeah, I got the invisible one. You see that? <laughs> <laughs> That's the generation four. But what is your daily routine like, um, if you care to share it? Well, over coffee in the morning, I like to wake up with a spelling bee. <laughs> um, I am lately learning French on Duolingo. Mm -hmm. So I try to do that a little bit in the morning be while I'm like, while I'm brushing my teeth and mm -hmm. fixing my hair. I'll yep. do the conversational parts. Um, but then I get to work. And I wish I could tell you that I was read, I had a regular amount that I read. Mm -hmm. I don't because I have a very bad habit mm -hmm. that when I'm really enjoying what I'm reading, I can't stop so when i start a book if i <laughs> like it i can't stop so i really kind of time my personal reading to when i'm taking vacation or i really have the time to lose myself in a book mm. um so otherwise it's just the articles i like reading quantum magazine mm. And 
but I always have a pile of reading that I want to get to. Mm -hmm. So it's next to my bed. It's on my desk. So I have all my shorter articles on my desk. So when I have a chance to read, I will. So it's, um, you know, I look forward to vacation time so I can immerse myself in something. Mm. And so, so those and are- I like crossword puzzles, as mm-hmm. you <laughs> said. And then in the evening, I can really relax and get competitive with Duolingo and make sure that I get my points for the day so I stay in the Diamond League. Mm, that's the uh, called gamification. You can turn habits uh, into rewards mechanisms and the human brain releases a little dopamine when you do something good. And uh, yeah, maybe we can pivot to to another topic. This is I asked Jim when he was on last year. Um, and it has to do with maybe, you know, how you spend your time, how you spend your attention. You know, people say the the most precious resource is time. And I agree with that. Uh, but I asked him, you know, another precious resource is money. And I asked Jim, you know, what is the purpose of wealth? What, where do you see wealth as, 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 you know, philosophically, does it mean anything? Does it mean, you know, oh, money is not important. No, I, I think it is. And um, what's your philosophy of philanthropy and of wealth in general? Because as I told Jim, you know, you can have a, a big boat, but you can only have one of them. You can't water ski behind two yachts at the same time. <laughs> um, so he, he said, you know, he, he definitely appreciates it. He likes the benefits of the wealth, but it's, it's for him, it's a, it's a type of tool. But I'm curious, what is wealth to you? So I would definitely say it's opportunity. Mm-hmm. As you're saying, there's only so, so much you could get. And if I am going out and buying gifts for people or going shopping for a new dress for myself, I make the joke that I'm going out to stimulate the economy. <laughs> but <laughs> Practical microeconomics. <laughs> yeah. But... You know, having wealth, I I see the business model. You invest, you earn income, and that's an income stream that you can use to support the things you really care about. Mm -hmm. So um, I've tried to really look for impact Mm -hmm. and evolve in my thinking, but I think that's what it is, the mm-hmm. opportunity to have an impact and try to make the world a little bit better. You wish you could make it a lot better. You wish you could make a lot of things a lot better, but to focus and really try to bring about some positive change. Mm-hmm. And I want to also uh, extend a, a commendation to how great you are at getting gifts. And actually, I want to pivot that to a question uh, some people are, are curious about. Um, have you? Do you have a specific book? Let's just focus on books that you've given as a gift very frequently in your life and career. Is there is there one book or maybe a couple of books that you find you want to share so much with other people and that you give it to them as a gift? Besides my book, I, I, my books. I know you give out those. But... Well. It's hard for me to tell, like I'm older now, so I can most, I can best remember the latest book that really had an Mm -hmm. impact on me. Yeah. And that that is a book called The Choice. Mm. And I'd have to look up the author's name, but it's a woman about a woman who survived Auschwitz Mm -hmm. and she um, came here to the U S and became a psychoanalyst and ultimately worked on her whole life in thinking about, and this is what she's talking about, that things happen in our lives, but we can choose how they impact us Mm. and how we move forward through them. And it's a remarkable story of her own resiliency. Mm -hmm. And it's really inspiring. And I 
have given that book out in my family Mm -hmm. and um, we're hoping to have a little book club session to talk about that with each other. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. I asked Jim the same question and he had given me advice, a book, his favorite book. Do you know what Jim's favorite book is, by the way, or most gifted book? No. It's called The Captain. It's about a a sea captain, I think in the early part of World War II uh, on a transport ship, Um, but it's very, uh, it's semi non, uh, semi fictional although it's based on this true life story of, you know, these transport boats during World War II. Anyway, I found that fascinating because it's really a book about, it's a stealth leadership book. It talks about, you know, leading this, this group under extreme uh. duress and, and challenges, et cetera. Um, so you've spoken a little bit about mathematics and, and economics. Um, I want to take uh, just a quick detour to the year I was born, 1971, 50 years ago. Um, you were came into the picture a little bit after that, but uh, at least in my personal uh, history, my universe. Um, but in that year, that was the year the U.S. went off the gold standard. And a lot of economists I've listened to correlate that with the necessity, not just the optionality, but the necessity of women entering the workforce in many different fields. And I wonder, you know, is there a perspective on that you can give to young women? I have a lot of young women that listen to the show. Um, You know, how do you balance, how did you balance your careers, plural, um, and raising your children um, amidst, you know, all the other activities that you had to do? Um, Obviously, you didn't have to. It wasn't like, you know, inflation caused you to have to, you know, pick up a second job. Although you weren't, you know, Jim's really financial success didn't take off until much later, I would say. Right. Um, but, uh, but, you know, how, how do you balance that? What advice do you give to women that are struggling between, you know, raising a family, doing a job, being, having a life? <laughs> you know, we, we always leave that out. You know, they need friends just like anybody else. They need uh, distractions. They need uh, respite and personal. How do you, what advice do you give to women nowadays? Do you think it's getting better or, um, or do you think there's still a lot more we can do specifically in the sciences? So, I can't say that I had a wonderful master plan (laughs) or that I didn't also struggle and talk with my friends as we struggled to find a, a reasonable balance between being moms and also having the stimulation of being involved in the workforce and being with our peers every day. So I, you know, I responded to the needs of our family, of my family at the time. Mm. So I did get my PhD and I did have child care and I actually, at that time, so I guess I started grad school somewhere around 76 or 78, something Mm -hmm. like that. Um, I didn't, (laughs) I managed to fill in the form and get a green card Mm. for the lady who was working for me because it didn't occur to me to go to a lawyer (laughs) to ask for help getting a green card. So I actually totally qualified for getting uh, and employing somebody who didn't have a green card. So that worked out, that fell into place. And I worked at home on my dissertation and Yolanda really helped me with child care. And, but um, when my daughter was born, um, I, she, de- she needed to go to therapy for extra help. Mm-hmm. And I felt like my family really needed me mm. and that I needed to take her to therapy and it would be hard to have a part-time job as an economist. Mm. And so my life took a different track than I had expected, but there was a need. 
And um, it turned out Jim was very supportive of my getting involved in not-for-profits. He liked the idea that somebody in the family Mm -hmm. was um, doing volunteer work. And I went on my first board. And that kind of worked out really well for me because I had time, a block of time where I could be project oriented Mm. rather than full time work. So I, a couple of boards, I realized I love the budget and finance committee. I really like, you know, thinking about how to make a not for profit of successful business, how to raise money for it. So as Jim started to be successful in his business, that's what made me say, hey, why don't we start our own foundation? Mm -hmm. And we didn't have, we had a lot of money by our standards then. We started with a million dollars. And the foundation was just me. I like to say that, um, I, this all has a bottom line that answers your question. <laughs> so let me give the spoiler alert. Yeah. The spoiler alert is I responded from uh, to need. I I then I was lucky to find opportunities, and as my time allowed my opportunities kind of evolved into more than I ever imagined. So that's the spoiler alert. (laughs) So, you know, I said to Jim, I say to people when I talk about our foundation, unlike Bill Gates or Warren Buffett, we didn't first make a fortune and then decide to give it away. We started small and it grew, it grew faster than we imagined. And we just kind of adapted and went with the change. And that's how the foundation happened. And Mm. it it was a surprise. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky. So I think that bottom line, and maybe this ties back to my school motto Mm. from Catholic Girls School just looking for opportunities, taking chances, going to trying out something new and just making the most of it. So my school motto when I was a kid was, I am only one, but I am one. I can't do everything, but I can do something. And what I can do, I ought to do. And what I ought to do, by the grace of God, I will do. So, you know, I, you know, that's I think something that has guided me. It's a paraphrase of something by someone who's, I think his name is Hale H A L A. Maybe his first name is Everett, but. you know, just kind of taught me if I see something that needs to be done, I try to do it. Mm. So, that's you know. wonderful. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. It kind of dovetails nicely into our uh, our final segments where we uh, do discuss the existential questions of life. We'll get to that in a second. But the last um, topic for the main segment of our conversation has to do with philanthropy, specifically in science. And I remember an article in the New York Times, you know, kind of decrying, well, you know, should these billionaires have so much influence in scientific funding? And I remember you just stop that, you know, kind of dead in its tracks. And you, and you stated that what are the unique benefits of, of private versus public and how private compares to public funding. So maybe you can recapitulate that. Um, what's your response to somebody who says, oh, you know, it's not fair that Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos and the Simon, they have so much influence on things that should be the purview solely of the U.S. government. How, how do you respond to that, Marilyn? that I think the U.S. government does a great job 
the NIH has, you know, really made the U.S. economy and the U.S. research system the powerhouse that it is. Still, there are niches, there are risks to take. Mm -hmm. There's so there's a place for philanthropy for, you know, those out there ideas. Um, though when I look at LIGO, I can only admire the National Science Foundation and its incredible commitment and vision to make that happen. Um, that's nothing that any private philanthropist could do, but maybe just kind of seeding initial ideas to help them get to the level that they'll be more attractive to the government. Mm. Um, you know, there's, there are niches. I've also heard from John Holdren when, when we went there that um, there are some things that are harder for the government to do like interdisciplinary research mm. to bring people in from across um, fields. And so there's a place to have an impact, um, but it's small. I mean, in private philanthropy will always hopefully be dwarfed by what the U.S. government does. Yes. But I think that we also try to work with the government. We do have some partnerships at the Simons Foundation with the National Science Foundation. So there's also a role to play to supplement their efforts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I, think I think they like public-private partnerships. I think they do. And now it's not only percolating you know, from traditional partnerships, uh, you know, a faculty sabbatical to, uh, you know, interdisciplinary collaborations between private and public foundations at the level of NSF, DOE, and, and beyond. Um, I think you said once the you know, philanthropy should be like venture capital, um, which does combine your economic kind of background and your scientific philanthropy background. I think that is a great model. And I heard you say once, you know, that, that foundation, a small foundation can be nimble and as wealthy as the foundation might be or as how many assets it's still pitifully small compared to you know just what yes. the government spends in a single <laughs> yes. day um and so if it can be the catalyst it can nucleate collaborations it can catalyze things and then that ultimately and I you believe, can make a quick decision exactly and that then allows the government to save money which is what you know taxpayers should be most appreciative of that the foundation offsets the initial seed capital that's needed to in this model uh, extend to uh, to benefits to the taxpayer of which you know you and I are both members of the taxpaying public as well I want to um, you know conclude uh, with the existential questions that I ask all my guests and Jim you can go back to I'll have a link to Jim's interview if you want to uh, see how he answered it but I always ask what I call the thrilling three final questions that help get to uh, the core of who you are as a kind of a heroine in the, in the journey that you've gone on in your life, the challenges, the action, the epiphanies, the climaxes that you've had in your life, in your career. And I tie them in either philosophically or technically to Arthur C. Clarke or the Bible. <laughs> um, and so if you're willing, Marilyn, I would love to ask you uh, in the remaining couple of minutes, these thrilling three questions. Would you mind answering and going into the impossible? Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. The first <laughs> one is, <clears throat> what would you put in your ethical will, not your material will? Ethical wills are uh, established since the time of you know the ancients and the Bible, even Alfred Nobel in his uh, Nobel Prize uh, uh, will, he had a requirement that the Nobel Prize go to those people who made the world a better place, the bettered mankind. And so I want to ask you, what kind of wisdom or thing, knowledge have you learned that you want to bequeath to your, not just your biological children, but your ideological children? So... On my desk at the foundation, I had a sign that I made for 
myself Mm -hmm. to look at. And um, it was actually a quote from Plato. And it was, always be kind for everyone is fighting a hard battle. And I like that reminder Mm. every day just to, you know, people matter and to really look at every person's humanness and know how we're all struggling. Mm. So I use that as a reminder for myself. So I think I would definitely pass one, pass that on, just be kind. Mm -hmm. We're all having a hard time and struggling. Yeah, indeed. And uh, the next question now goes a little bit deeper into the future. It goes, let's say a billion years into the future. And this is reminiscent of uh, the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey. Uh, where these uh, monoliths, these ominous kinds of structures that seem to be like time capsules, or perhaps they're warnings or signs of some kind uh, placed by an unseen alien civilization, maybe billions of years ago, and they're meant to be discovered maybe as a testimony uh, to what they accomplished. I want to ask you, um, in science uh, specifically, and that you've been exposed to everything from the life sciences autism science, uh, physical sciences, cosmology, uh, quantum, uh, quantum mechanical systems, mathematics. Is there anything that you feel best encapsulates the accomplishments that the human species has accomplished, the, the, the most stunning or striking accomplishment or accomplishments uh, that humanity has achieved in just a short few hundred thousand years we've made an impact on the planet? So when you're talking about that, it kind of reminds me of that, the the movie or the play or story about Camelot. Mm. And I know that there was that song, um, tell everyone that there was once a, fleeting wisp of glory in Camelot. Mm. And, you know, Camelot was about trying to live together in perfect harmony. Mm -hmm. And I guess you talked about all these sciences, but, you know, I can't take credit for this. I have to say um, that I heard Jim once say, that if there's one science we haven't made a lot of progress with, it's political science. Mm. And I kind of, you know, I think we are striving to learn to live in a world where we could get along together and dealing with coronavirus Mm. or climate change Mm. that we're starting to see ourselves more as the biosphere that we are. So um, I guess just learning to live together in harmony with our planet, with each other, with all the other living things on this planet um, is something that I, I don't know how to encapsulate that idea except to see that we are trying to do that and science is helping us get there Mm. to understand our role in our biosphere. So I I don't know what the short phrase is, Mm -hmm. if it's learn political science (laughs) or, or like you're part of the biosphere and learn how to make this work. Mm. I think that's where we have to go. Wonderful. Okay, Marilyn, the last question uh, will take us not to the future, but to your past. Sort of advice to your former self. And it's based on one of Arthur C. Clarke's laws. He had all these different laws. And he said, the only way of distingu- of, the only way of discovering the limits of the possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And that's the origin of the name of my podcast. So I want to accordingly ask you what mysterious aspect of life perplexed you as a 20 year old or 30 year old and what kind of lesson would you teach to her 
uh, to give her the courage to do as you've done to go into the impossible. Is there any advice to your former self you can give? Make a plan. <laughs> I think. <laughs> I, mm -hmm. I, um, you know, I, once I was talking, giving a toast and about a mathematician and I learned that some, some uh, mathematicians are mountains and some are rivers. Hmm. I think that I've lived my life more as a river going a little bit this way or that way. Mm -hmm. But being a mountain, I like climbing to the top and seeing what's up there when you get there. So, um, you know, a river has a little less of a plan. I think I make a plan. Mm. <laughs> so... <laughs> Very but my good. river took me to some wonderful places. Indeed. And hopefully you're just getting started in this new chapter in your journey. And I just want to relate uh, a story, you know, of possibly how Marilyn caused me to become an astronomer. And it relates back to a time she was with me as a young as a young boy. I think I was four or five. My mom tells this story and I had the croup. And it was very uh, serious back then to have the croup. And, you know, every parent knows the feeling of helplessness and hopelessness uh, of uh, a, a kid that's sick and how to take care of him. And so my mom was, uh, you know, was busy with my, uh, my sibling, my brother, Kevin. And so you took me out on a very cold night in the middle of winter. Uh, and you said to me, according to my mom, that each snowflake was a falling star. And it just mesmerized me. And she credits that with perhaps my interest in astronomy. And I think it's fitting that, as we know, falling stars are uh, fragments of asteroids that fall to Earth. And I want to also remind people that Marilyn Simons is the proprietor of asteroid number 10701, <laughs> Marilyn Simons, uh, 1981 PF, discovered at Harvard. Uh, in 1981, it has many, many fascinating characteristics, including the fact that it can orbit inside the orbit of the Earth. Uh, and you can find out more information at the Minor Planet Center. It was awarded to Marilyn Simons, an American economist and philanthropist. She's, she was, I think you were chair of the board of Cold Spring Harbor, and you founded the Stony Brook Women's Leadership Council, many things, fellowships, uh, and was recently retired as the president of the Simons Foundation. And she supports basic math, science, and medical research around the world, and is now a member of the Légion d'Honneur. And Marilyn, I want to thank you so much. Uh, we love you. We, we have uh, utmost respect and gratitude for you in this holiday season, but throughout the year as well. I want to thank you for spending so much of your valuable time with myself and my audience today. Well, Brian, thank you. And can I tell a little story about you, though? Okay. <laughs> of course. And your family that was like such an important part of my life. Mm. And the year I lived with you and your mom and your brother when I was a grad student, like I think that was transformative in my life. And I just loved the time that we were all together. And I just want to say, you know, I spend a lot of time in outreach and I I don't know how you spark curiosity. That was a word you used a lot. Mm -hmm. And you were such a naturally curious <laughs> child. I would be so amazed at things that you knew when there didn't seem to be anybody teaching you these things. Mm -hmm. um, but you would just dazzle me with things that you would talk about. I remember one day in particular, though, and that your grandfather came to visit. This was your mother's father. Mm -hmm. And he said to you and Kevin, want to go out on a safari? And we didn't, we, you didn't live in Africa. You lived on <laughs> Long Island. 
And you're, you all got, you and Kevin got all bundled up to go out on a safari with your grandfather. <laughs> and when you came back, you had walked around the, the neighborhood and just collected all these things that were natural around mm -hmm. leaves, sticks, bugs, I don't, whatever mm -hmm. you could find. And I, that store, that afternoon just stuck with me mm -hmm. about just going off and exploring your own neighborhood, not to go, you didn't have to fly across the globe. You <laughs> didn't, it was right there. There was so much to explore in your own backyard, in your own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, um, You've really held on to a remarkable sense of curiosity <laughs> and so much more. And well, thank you so much. Yeah, it's it's funny. Yeah, my, my motto on this channel is ABC, always be curious. And I, I find that is the most important, uh, the most important tool. You know, passion is great. Passion is kind of the spark that ignites the rocket, but you need that fuel. And I think curiosity can sustain a lifelong passion. Um, and hopefully use that to make the world a slightly better place. And you have made my world a better place since I've known you uh, almost all my life. And my mother sends it's her love. It's mutual. It is. Yes. I want to just thank you for sharing your time with us and my audience today. And uh, I wish you the best of, uh, of health and happiness in 2022, Marilyn. All right. Same to you, Brian, and to your whole beautiful family. Thank you. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic.